Can't wait Basically, I'm going to have cyborg babies at this point. Let's yeah. fucking go. What the fuck is going on with um like Roswald and fucking MK Ultra, uh, all that kind of shit? The CIA have UFOs. Government mind control. Yep. UFOs. Anyway, let's talk all about that sex. good shit. Let's talk, let's about, talk sex. about sex. Okay, so serious question. Why were you conservative? I was homeschooled K through 12. I was born and raised that way. So mm -hmm. it was one of those things of I was always curious about it, but because of a combination of the church and a combination of lack of knowledge of how to take an opportunity is what I'm going to say. I never really had the opportunity to get around to it. So and... here's my question. When you're <laughs> right, like, when go. you're raised like super conservative and shit, like, mm -hmm. do you even think of sex or does the thought of sex come into your mind and you're like, no, 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 no. Like I literally have to push that out of my mind. Like how often did you think about sex when you were super? Uh, probably if I was going to make a conservative estimate, see what I did there. I would say maybe, I don't know, 12, 13 hours a day. Thinking about sex. And did yeah. you, okay. So do you feel like a bad person when you're thinking about it? All the like, fucking time. Like the devil is in my brain trying to fucking just get All his little the time. tentacles in there and fuck me with his mind control. I heard a joke once uh, that said uh, Catholics have the same vice as everyone else does. Just uh, Catholics have all that much more time to feel guilty about it. And it's such a weird, like, th so I was this not is Catholic, one, but like deeply, deeply conservative, but like, it it's such a weird thing where you're pulled in two different directions. It's like, you're fighting your own biology. You're fighting what I yeah. call like, it's almost like you're fighting the truth of the universe. Like we all yeah. like sex. Sex is nice. Sex gives something. You're fighting that every single second of your day. And funnily enough, you make the vices stronger or you make the urges stronger. If you just, as you figure oh, out, if you, just, if you just have sex, you can get on with your day. Like you can go and make the world a better place. You can go and be a, a great religious, you know, outspoken, wonderful human being who gives back to the world. But you almost can't when you're sitting there repressing these like basic human needs. And funnily it's enough they go against the their own mission which is like to spread good throughout the world maybe you can be cynical and say their mission is to spread just religion itself but i i like to see the good in conservatism and, and mm -hmm. religion and that i think their mission is to help other people and it's really hard to fucking do that and be a good person when you're sitting there going like i'm horny i'm horny i'm horny i'm horny and i'm bad i'm bad i'm bad i'm bad how do you give back to the world when you're sitting there going i'm bad it's one of those things of like if you say tell someone not to think of a pink elephant, they're going to be thinking of a pink elephant because you yeah. can't not think of something. You have to think of something else instead. And so there is that meditation aspect of learning to control what you're putting your effort and energy towards. But also I remember when I first uh, lost my virginity, like, you know, there's Hollywood, there's porn, there's all these things that give us this ideas and expectation. And I was like, that's it. Mate. Okay, mate. So like, you just, you've continued. Sex is continue. good, but sex is good but sex isn't like this life-changing uh amazing like oh my goodness guys I just, like there's that uh lonely island song i just had sex yep and 100 yep. when i get married i'm going to post that shit on my facebook my wedding day and, <laughs> yeah. because i think it's hilarious but that being said so what yeah. like it's not that big a deal. And as soon as I started having sex, it, I realized, oh, it's just sex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, I, you're, you're spoiling. I'm going to pull up a text here. You're spoiling. I am going to, my girlfriend Imogen and I recently met this chick who's like 23 and a virgin because she had the exact same shit that you're talking about where she, she wasn't like deeply religious, but she had these ideas from like from Hollywood, from Disney, from porn, from just things she wanted that I'm going to wait until Prince Charming comes into my life and, and I'm going to lose my virginity to him. And so she'd gotten like pretty close, but never gone all the way. And basically, you know, she decided, okay, I'm not going to sit here and wait forever. Maybe this is silly. And we had sex with her the other day. I'm going to get her on the podcast. That's why I say this is a spoiler. She's she's happy to come on the podcast here. But I basically said to her, like, how do you feel afterwards? Like the, the day after I said, sent her a text, like, how do you feel? And she said, I feel good. Actually, no different. And we had this discussion where I was like, it's just sex. Like, it's mm -hmm. nice. It's wonderful. It opens a whole new world to you. It, it's, it's like an adventure that you now get to explore. But it is just sex. It's such yeah. a fucking, like, it's wonderful. Don't get me wrong. For any fucking virgins out there, go and have sex. It's it's fucking wonderful. But it's like saying, 
Disneyland is going to change my life. If I go to Disneyland and spend a day there, it's going to change my life. And it's like, no, it'll be a great, wonderful adventure. It'll be fun. Yeah, for sure. You can share it with your family and friends, which I don't recommend sharing sex with your family and friends. But hey, you know, who am I to judge? Maybe with I'm your friends. Fine. I'm not going to kink shame. But it's not, it's not like... It's not like you suddenly become a different person. You're exactly like, is that how you felt after you lost your virginity? You're still the same person. You've now just had sex. Um, there was a lot more shame involved at that point still, but okay. yeah. Okay. Like, did you tell, cause it was an older woman you said, and yeah. I'm assuming she relatively took the lead. Story time. Let's go. Go. Um, so I am 23 years old and working at Starbucks as one does. And mm -hmm. there was, I had been going to Bible school for the past two years for even more context, because let's put it in there. And, um, one of the, my supervisors was, uh, 43 years old. She has a background in art and art history, but also she was born and raised a missionary. So we got to collect, connect a lot on an intellectual and spiritual level, but at the same time, she was very, uh, post Christianity, very much, feminism, uh, okay. empowerment, and all those things. And so it came to a point where we were hanging out once and I had in my head, if I ask her if she's interested in me, then she will take care of all of the rest. Yeah, interesting. Okay. So I was very lucky in that sense of, I'm like, do I want to do this? Well, I feel like this is a terrible idea, but I'm going to do it. <laughs> and so I did it. And we kept hanging out and we started making out and slowly and steadily things built until mm -hmm. uh, about two months later, uh, we had sex for the first time. And I was like, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and I could not connect the disconnect with it's just sex and the shame of, yeah, I have graduated Bible school. I'm no longer doing that. So like, I don't have any, ethical obligation to behave in such moral tones but at the same time this goes against everything that i've ever learned and ever known so and it felt disappointing because i wanted more from it and did so you there want was it to feel bad like did I you want it, to feel, it to feel bad i wanted it to feel good but i wanted it to feel better than it did yeah like yeah. i was expecting there to be some sort of amazing closeness afterwards and afterwards it was, it was just like congratulations you had sex would you mm -hmm. like a star would you yeah. like a high five yeah. and it was this transitioning period where i thought it was oh shoot i'm having a mental breakdown because i don't know what i'm doing right now and i'm having sex and i shouldn't be having sex and i'm not behaving like a christian but i still hold christian ideals and yeah it was a it was a mess that i did not handle very well god bless her so how did you consolidate those two ideas? Like, are you still religious now? Um, yes. Okay. So how did you like form? Cause I, I, I would imagine you almost have to like tear down all the walls of what you've learned and go, how do I rebuild this? Like, how do I come up with my own idea of what religion means to me or my connection to God or the universe? Like, was there a process there? Um, there was, and there wasn't. Uh, shortly after that, I got into a, uh, abusive relationship, which was just a terrible idea all the way around. Like I knew I, I was done with the relationship. A, there, brother. I, can I knew I was done with the relationship about two months in, but I thought, oh shoot, am I afraid of relationships? So, because before that point I had been sleeping with, uh, two more of the supervisors from my store, because if you're going to sleep with your coworkers, always sleep up the you ladder. Well never fuck down. with all of them. Yep. <laughs> Always sleep up, never down. That way, in case of liability, <laughs> you're not at fault. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> That's what Harvey Weinstein did wrong. That's what I he mean, did apart wrong. from all the other shit, but yeah. I mean, I'm not here to judge other people's life choices. Only put my own on display. Maybe someone will learn from them. Good um, man, must be. Sorry, what was the question? I don't fucking remember. This is a shit uh, show of a podcast. I'm joking. <laughs> this, is, this is going fabulously. So, so the question was consolidating those two ideas like consolidating your, those two your ideas. view of like religion your connection to the spiritual world god so, the universe whatever you want to call it i'm a firm believer in jesus christ as my personal lord and savior i love him to death jesus is my homie jesus was a cool dude i've read the bible jesus was sick i'll give you that
Jesus was sick. Um, <laughs> that being said, I had this interesting disconnect between I love Jesus. Mm -hmm. I don't like his people right now. And so hmm. it was a journey of, okay, Jesus, what I'm about to embark on is admittedly not a spiritual desire. I want to go do some ho shit. Mm -hmm. because turns out I can be pretty good at doing ho shit if I let myself do ho shit. So I'm gonna go do ho shit. So I uh, said, okay, I'm taking a year off of this whole Christianity thing of serving you of all of that. I'm gonna go do some ho shit. Mm -hmm. And then I got in a relationship for the next six months that ended up in a miscarriage. Thank God. <laughs> Probably should not have said that, but that's okay. And I said, no, I'm restarting the clock. Like I did not get to enjoy that. So I'm going to enjoy this. And it was an interesting thing of in my loneliness, in spite mm -hmm. of the fact that I can have someone occupy my bed at a moment's notice of realizing sex is something that I really like, mm -hmm. but sex doesn't fix me anything more than anything else did. Correct correct like you and had someone it. on your up oh, sorry after you no you you go you go i'll come back to my you thing. had someone on your podcast uh i think it was lost cause who yep when you interviewed him uh he said after he lost his virginity to an escort he said well now i can't use that as an excuse anymore but it still kind of feels like an excuse of yeah. his virginity mm -hmm. and it was one of those things of like well i'm having sex and i don't feel better Mm -hmm. but at least I'm having sex. So, you know, that's a win. Mm -hmm. And so it was this weird transition period of having to confront my problems and not being able to hide behind what I think that they are. Yes. Because anything can be a problem, but not everything is a problem. Mm -hmm. And there's almost a journey of, I mean, there is really a journey of like self, uh, self discovery, self improvement, self acceptance, whatever you want to call it. Like, if you're sitting there and you're a virgin, that's obviously like that is right in front of you. And that's all you can see. I want to lose my virginity. I don't, especially for guys, I don't feel like a man. I don't feel like I've fulfilled my duties. I don't feel like I've fulfilled my potential. You handle that. And yes, that is one thing that's handled. But what that often does is it pulls away the veil of, it's almost like that's what you thought the problem was. But we take that curtain away and oh my God, there's like 500 other things there. And it's not necessarily that there's things wrong with you or problems to fix or anything. It's more just like, Okay, I thought sex was the be-all and end-all. I thought if I got laid and lost my virginity, or maybe, you know, some guys decide I'm going to have sex with 20 girls or 30 girls, and that's going to just be everything I want from life. You do that, and then you're like, oh, shit, what am well, I left what? with now? Yeah, now I'm left with the questions of what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Do I want to give back to the world? Do I want to be fully selfish? Do I want to do this? Do I want to do that? Do I want to make a lot of money? Do I like, do I want to have an elite You're body? Left exactly where you started just with 20 or 30 more lays under your belt. Exactly, cool. exactly. And there's a lot that you learn through that process. And mm -hmm. I'm going to be the first person to say that that's incredibly fucking fun. I would never oh, take any absolutely. of my lays away. Exactly. But it's not... It's part of the journey. Let's just say that. And I think definitely, especially with when I first started like content and stuff like this, when I first started my blog, in my mind, I was like, if I can just help guys get laid, like that's everything I want to ever do. And you do that for a while and you get laid yourself. And then at some point you're like, I can't do this for the next 50 years. Like I can't <laughs> just get guys laid for the next 50 years. Like Jesus, what a, what a failure to launch that would be. What a, what a, that would be like taking, that would be like enrolling in university and you go to the first weeks of lectures and then you stop. And it's like, you were supposed to finish the next three years of university. Why did you stop at week one? It very much feels like that with life. I think that's a decent metaphor for life. If you just go out and have a lot of sex, that's like fucking wonderful. That's fucking fun. But it's the same thing that people do with money. Some people just go and I'm going to make as much money as I possibly can and nothing okay, else. So what? Exactly. Now you've got a exactly. lot of money. So what? Exactly. Like, what are you going to do with that money? What else comes next? What self-improvement is there? How do you connect to other people? What is your point of being here? Is that going to make you happy forever? People say like money doesn't buy happiness. It does, but it doesn't forever. And it's not the only thing that you will ever Money doesn't need. buy happiness. It just buys more luxurious misery. I like that. I think that's cynical. I'm very fucking grateful for money, but I get the general sentiment there. It's like, you, you, if you're not 
here's a better way of saying it. It's a, it's a dang- sorry. Statistically speaking, say? money does improve quality of life up till around eighty thousand U.S. dollars. I've heard, uh, yeah, annually. seventy something, eighty thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're before that, if you're below that, you're basically in like poverty, and above that, it's like after that, it doesn't improve happiness. But until that point, yes, it does. Money buys yeah. happiness. You can heard it here first, folks. Put that on your gravestone. But it, it, I was going to say, <laughs> it's, a, it's a dangerous fucking game to mm-hmm. pin all your hopes and dreams and your future happiness on one particular goal. Olympians do the same thing. They get a gold medal and they go, shit. They have like this this fall from grace. And they're like, well, what am I supposed to do now? Celebrities do the same thing. Rock stars do the same thing. Billionaires do the same thing. Getting laid people do the same thing. I've seen so many guys go, I'm going to get 50 lays. You yourself have slept with, what, 50-something women. Like I've lost count. And, and and that in itself, it's fucking fun. But again, it's like saying I'm going to go to Disneyland 50 times and that's going to make mm-hmm. me happy. It's like it will make you happier. It's a fun thing to do, but it's not like fully satisfying. It's not your mission of life. It's not your purpose. And one thing I've started doing, asking my coaching clients when we first sit down, the first thing I'll ask them is what do you want? Like this coaching program, what do you want by the end of it? What are your goals? And they'll tell me like, oh, I want to get laid. I want to make money. I want this. And then I'll say, okay, great, brilliant. Now, what's your life purpose? What are you here for? What's your mission? What do you want from life? What do you want by the end of like when you're at the deathbed on your deathbed? And every single one of them goes like, oh, shit. Oh, fuck. I've never been asked that question. And we talk about it for like an hour or so. They think about it. And then they're like, oh, holy shit. Like, I actually feel more excited about the life purpose shit rather than just like getting laid five times or having a threesome or doing this. So I'm glad you've come to that same sort of realization of like sex is fucking wonderful. Don't get me wrong. Jesus fucking Christ, especially if you're not having any you're missing something you're missing something but yeah it's it's not it's not going to fully satisfy you and i hope that we've made it clear here that i hope people like especially newbies new guys listening i hope they don't hear all this and go oh so what so sex isn't fun it's like we'll talk about this the fun stuff in sex in a minute like sex is fun but it's not the only thing in life and i would hope that no one is sitting there listening or reading my website or you know listening to this and going if I can just get laid, everything will be perfect. It's like, no, that's when the real, that's when the real shit begins. Like once you get laid and you're like, oh shit, I'm not perfectly happy. I'm happier, but I'm not perfectly happy. What do I do now? You, so uh, you do. You mentioned that, uh, getting sex, getting laid and having sex is just the start of your journey and it makes you a better person. And that has been something I've realized of when I started, I was, I'm not going to say I was selfish. I was definitely very generous uh, during sex of like, I'm making sure the other person's taken care of. I'm making sure that the girl I'm with is having a good time because that's just good retention. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yep. Like, no, you don't want to be the person that people are like, well, I mean, he has a nice dick. But that's, he is a dick. Like, no, like it's was one of those things of, okay, cool. Now what? And I was living in the middle of a small town. We're going to call racist redneck California because it was racist and it was redneck and it was in California. That's and right. You're white. So that's fine. Like you're, mean, not, you're not on the receiving end of the racism. I mean, technically accurate. So I was living there and I had that moment of, well, cool. I'm having sex. Now what? Hmm. And, um, I was, a uh, pretty involved in the kink scene i was a regular at the dungeon town nice. so had an orgy or two like we're having a good time and then i'm like okay this is boring i don't like it here this is tiny hmm. what do i want my life to be about yeah and what do i want my life to be about is was a much easier question for me than what do I want to do? Because what do I want to do was just, Oh shit. I don't know what I want to do. Yeah. Like, yeah, I have given everything up for the past six years doing Bible school stuff. So I don't really have any dreams because they've all been stripped away. Mm-hmm. What do I want my life to be like? Mm. Well, I think I'd like my life. To, I'd like my life to be a little bit more family. Like, mm-hmm. well, what does that look like? So there was two options. Both of them were moving. I could either move to Los Angeles because my sibling lives there and he's got two daughters now, mm-hmm. maybe three. He's got two children <laughs> or the other option, complete opposite side of the country, 
moved to Michigan because I've got grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins out here. And let's be honest, I haven't really spent time with them since I was a child. So Mm -hmm. I decided to move across the country because, okay, congratulations. You're doing what you want with your life. Well, what would you like your life to look like is the next level of that question. Yes. Yes. And so I decided I wanted to make my life a little bit more about family because people matter. And my family did not have a value for family growing up, but they wanted to have a value for family growing up. So, okay, let's change that. Let's make that a value in my life. There's another way of phrasing what you just said before. You know, the the first level is like, what do I want to do? Like the first level Mm -hmm. of happiness is what do I want to do? And often the answer is, well, I want to go and have a bunch of sex. I want to have some threesomes. I want to make a a, a million dollars. I want to do this. I want to do that. Like that's the first level of happiness. And then up from there, you kind of start thinking like, well, what do I want to have? Like, do I want to have a fancy apartment? Do I want to have a lot of friends? Do I want to have a Lamborghini? Do I want to have a, an amazing sex life? Do like, what stuff do I want to have? Do I want to have nice clothes? The level up from that. And it sounds like the level that you're at or the realization that you had is who do I want to be? like being rather than doing or having it's like what are my principles what you know do i want to be a family man do i want to be loving and generous to other people do i want to be a mentor do i want to be do i want to be this do i want to be that like who do i want to be as a human being or who do i want to be as a man or a person or a woman or whatever it is so it sounds like you've had that realization as well and that is the like and if let's make it clear if you're at the first level where you're like i just want to do some shit like my life has never been my own. I just want to have some sex. I just want to have a Lamborghini. I just like, fine. Like you work. I don't think Hell you yeah. just jump your way up. Nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't even know if you can just jump your way up to being, I think you can, but like, I understand that I didn't do that. You didn't do that. And so maybe we'd be hypocritical to say like, you must just jump up to a state of being and not worry about things that you have and want. If you have nothing and you feel like you don't get to do what you want, it's very hard for us to say like, just be the person you want to be. It's like, bro, I, I'm a virgin and I hate my life and I work a job I hate and I don't have any friends. Like, let well, me work my I way think it's circul- I think it's cyclical too of like, mm. you start doing things and then once you're doing things, you can decide who you want to be. And when yes. you are who you be or who you want to be, then things happen because of who you are. Yes. So yes. it's a little bit of a balance of you have yeah. to start doing things to realize who you want to be. And then once you know who you want to be, you do things to become who you want to be. Mm-hmm. And as you become who you want to be, you do what you want to do. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a self, it feeds back into itself. And we're kind of talking here a little bit like on the outskirts of the idea of like fake it till you make it. If you wanted to just be something, you might have to fake it till you make it. But an easier way of doing that is to just start doing the action. And then you kind of become that person. You don't have to fake it anymore. So both parts are equally valid, but do whatever works for you guys at the, at the point in time. But I'm glad you're at that point. That's really interesting. It's, it's was interesting. I had a moment of realizing I was at that point on the last date I was on, we were talking. And, um, one of the questions that I think I got from you that I like asking people is why the hell would you meet with someone off who you met off of Tinder who says, Hey, I'm a dom. I'm looking for people to tie up. Like you're interested in that. Cool. Tell me more about you. Like, why would you meet with someone like that? And we're chatting and she's asking me about my experience. And I'm like, well, actually, there's no real way I can talk about this without sounding like I'm bragging. So here we go. Mm-hmm. And you're going off into stories like they've done this, done that. But you realize, oh, hmm, my life is a little bit more unbelievable than it is believable. Mm-hmm. Alrighty then. That's a good place to be in there. <laughs> I like it's those phenomenal. stories. It's and I do phenomenal. think you, you change through doing all that. Like you do become that type of person. Like all the sex I've had, the BDSM stuff, especially has changed me as a person for sure. It sounds like it has mm-hmm. for you coaching, like mentoring, doing these podcasts has definitely changed me. Like you, you do become that person at the first, at, at first you are just doing it. Something that the, the girl that we're seeing right now, the girl that I said is, is probably going to come on the podcast. When we were on the first date with her, I can't remember what in particular the conversation was, but she was saying something and I gave her some advice, you know, I can't remember what it was about. And she looked at me and she said like very genuinely, like you really are a life coach, aren't you? And for some reason that made me like laugh and smile, you know, in this really like genuine way, because I was like, holy shit. Yeah. At some point I did just become 
the life coach. Like it's no longer what I'm doing or what I have. It's like, I am that like, and so even outside of doing a coaching call, you just become that person. I think BDSM is one of those things as well, especially in that Dom role, you sort of take on that, like almost it can, depending on your dynamic, it can be like fatherly, you almost become fatherly, but I definitely think you take on responsibility as the Dom. And that does seem to carry on. If you're, if you're a good Dom, I try not to judge with that, but you know what I mean by that? You can sort of take on this sort of responsibility outside of the bedroom and people go like, Oh, I can see why you're a Dom. Like you give off those kind of vibes. Like you, you, you're taking the lead. You give a shit about people. You have responsibility. You understand about other people's needs and you know, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, at some point you become that. One of my coworkers told me that I accidentally used my Dom voice with her at work. I said, Oh, that's how that conversation went. (laughs) <laughs> i've done that too i've said like good girl and stuff to, to like shopkeepers and shit and it's like oh fucking tone that down hey like don't be saying good girl because i have you a coffee <laughs> definitely said that to people after their place they've placed their order good girl yeah, we got yeah, you and it's like, i feel like they get the vibe and they're like oh shit like i like that i feel like because i feel like that's something you know we can go off on a little tangent here that kind of like almost what do you want to call it? It's almost like it's, it seems natural and instinctive to me now. Maybe it does for you too, to be mm-hmm. in that kind of like dominant position and those kind of like traditional gender roles, especially when you meet a girl who is submissive in the real world and you say good girl and they, they feel like, oh, I liked that, but am I allowed to like that? And you're like, yeah, you can fucking like that if you want to. It, it's, it's one of those things that just comes out and it's yeah. partly because when I'm at work, I work at a coffee shop. So I put a little bit of that barista fantasy, uh, mm-hmm roll up i play it up a little bit more that and then just toss in a little a little spit spice of gay just i wasn't aware there was people, a barista but... fantasy are women walking around going like gee no no you're right actually don't they they do they like they they have their coffee shop that they go to all the time they're like man that guy's cute i wish he would ask for my phone number and then tie me up and fuck me i mean i don't know but i i, I play it i figure if guys can have the uh, girl at the coffee shop they uh, they think about, yeah. then girls can have the guy at the coffee shop they think about. I've I've had a couple of female friends that have literally said, like, I have a crush on the, the guy at the coffee shop. Any females listening, leave a comment below and tell us how badly you want to get fucked by the guy at the coffee shop. Use those exact words, because I know that's how women like to talk. Literally say, I want to get fucking railed by the fucking hot hunk of piece of fucking meat at my coffee shop. And don't do that that's machine. objectifying that's objectifying guys please be nice you know or do objectify guys we usually yeah, I don't know, right like no, literally no <laughs> guy was ever was like this girl is into me and she's looking at my body and she thinks i'm sexy just like don't please look at my personality instead so let's talk about threesomes let's talk about threesomes how do you have a threesome you've had several threesomes i have had five threesomes so far this year and uh... how how fucking easy are they and this is this is so so this is like my challenge right because you're gonna say it's not that hard is it is, is it hard is it hard to have it's a so fucking easy that, uh, yeah and so do you see how frustrating it is for me to like write a threesome guide and like half of the threesome guide is me literally just saying you can do this just i ask. believe in you yeah, just ask. just fucking ask girls would you like to sleep with this other girl that i'm seeing do you think she's pretty hey i think she's pretty or she thinks you're pretty too would you like to come over for some wine and beers or whatever yeah that sounds good okay now we're having a threesome but like it's this weird fantasy and I, i'm curious if it was for you it's this one fa- it's the one fantasy that you tell yourself i can't do that i did it too i, I took like five months to have my first threesome from the moment I first started training. Cause in my head, I was like, this is some porn level stuff. This isn't, I'm not cool enough for this. Did you have that? Or were you just like, fuck it, I'm going to try this. Um, it was a little bit of fuck it. I'm gonna try this. Okay. So I had a, uh, girl who was visiting me who, um, has been a good friend of mine for a long time. And then uh, on and off, we've had some chemistry mm-hmm. and, um, she was in town and I had just recently read your threesome guy. And I'm like, I'm going to try this. And so I asked her if she was interested in meeting um, one of my friends here. And partly I'm like, I'm pretty sure these two are going to vibe and get along. Yep. Like they will enjoy each other. Mm-hmm. But partly I'm like, let's go three something. Let's go. Come on, yep. come on, yep. come on, yep. come on, Jesus. <laughs> and so it was just that of like, I'm like, Hey, you think this person's pretty? Yeah. You think this person's pretty? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. And so we came over, they were hanging out. 
And then um, I stepped out of the room to grab some more wine or something like that. And they started talking and joking about a threesome. I'm um, like, mm-hmm. I haven't even insinuated or tried to set this up yet. Okay, interesting. Like, so you didn't even sell it as like a threesome. You just said like a YouTube attracted to each other. Like, do you think she's pretty? A little bit of, do you think she's pretty? And do you want to meet my friend? Because you're in town. Okay. Yeah. And they came, they were vibing. They were enjoying each other. And then uh, my friend suggested we play truth or dare. I'm like, alrighty then. That's I dare easy. you guys to suck my cock immediately and have sex and have a threesome. Like that's your first dare, literally. One hundred percent, my first dare. Get naked on. My Get dick. naked and fuck each other's fucking holes, you dirty hole fuckers. Something like that, yeah. That's so. If anyone else listening, that's like the best introduction to like BDSM or that's the best way to be a dom. Just speak like that. That's, that's my tip on dirty talking. There you go. We can end the podcast. That's a... it. <laughs> anyway, carry this one's on. not going on YouTube, is it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I put all this shit on YouTube. Fuck YouTube. Oh, oh you, YouTube you put, bear me. You, you, you put stuff like that on YouTube. Fuck yeah. I don't give a shit. What are they going to do? Take my channel down. That's cool. Right? Demonetize you. I'm not monetized anyway. I've made $3 and 85 cents ever from YouTube. Fair. Okay. So carry on threesome story. Um, so yeah, that went from truth or dare to, um, dare them to kiss. And then we weren't playing truth or dare anymore. That is okay. So in my head, that was how I wanted my threesome, like my threesomes to go. I've never done the whole like truth or dare thing, but like, that's, that's almost like the porn fantasy of like, let's play truth or dare. Oh my God. And then they were just doing each other. And then like, who knows? And then, oh my God, all of a sudden my first time was like kind of decent. It, okay. It was pretty fucking decent. It was my girlfriend and her best friend that had crushes on each other forever. And like at one time at a party, they'd made out with each other and like played with each other's pussies. And that was it. And so I basically got them over and they had some wine and then they just fucking, as soon as they were drunk, they just like threw themselves at each other. And I'm just sitting there going like, holy shit, is this real life? They're just like naked and like making it. I'm just like, is this fucking real? And then I had this, like we go into the bedroom and I had this moment of like insecurity and panic where I was like, oh shit. I'm just like the facilitator. They don't actually want me here. They just wanted an excuse to sleep with each other. And I was like feeling insecure. And I was like, oh my God, I'm the third wheel. How did I get cucked in my own apartment? Like, how am I getting cucked, right? (laughs) <laughs> and I'm like real sad. And I'm like literally about to go in the bed, in the bathroom and cry and shit. And then I was like, okay, Andy, you can do this. You're going to take a chance and you're going to try and like kiss them and see if they want to kiss you. And I did. And they like kissed me back. And I was like, okay, like we're on. They're not just like ignoring me. But yeah, mm-hmm. that's that's my first threesome story. Yours is way better. I like yours better. Mine was filled with fucking panic. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was definitely some awkward involved because. Yeah, yeah neither of them had ever gone all the way with a girl before yep yep it was actually one of them first time like even kissing a girl so yeah i'm like props to you that's pretty ballsy for the first time and i bet you she said exactly what they all say you say afterwards you say like so what what, like what was your experience of women like and they always say the same thing ready they go girls are really soft they always soft yep it's like the word they always (laughs) use girls are really soft and gentle you're like, yeah, because you don't have fucking like cool beards and shit, you losers. You can't even grow facial hair. Like, what the fuck? I'm supposed to respect that? Fuck. I mean, some of them can grow facial hair. <laughs> <laughs> God bless those women. Yeah, you just get it. We don't judge women who judge who uh, grow facial hair. I would never judge. So threesome, the, the main point here is threesomes are not that fucking difficult. Like, They're I get really that not. it's intimidating, but <laughs> you just got to do it. Or don't do it. Yeah. I actually had a couple uh, ask me the other day if I would uh, cuck the guy. I'm like, all right, re- weird request, but like, you guys want to grab a drink and talk about this? I, That's I the end of that story. It doesn't go any further than that. Oh, you didn't do it. <laughs> didn't you do it? Oh, they stopped talking to me after I'm like, sure, let's grab a drink. Yeah, I see that a lot like on Tinder and shit where it's like someone will have a sexual fantasy. And they mm-hmm. want that fulfilled right there and then. Like it's 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 they're horny or whatever. They just want it done immediately. They don't want to go to a bar and have a drink and slow it down and get to know you and all that kind of shit. They just want to get fucked immediately. And that was definitely a realization point for me of like, look, my time is valuable and I mm-hmm. can have sex 
pretty much like that. So let's make sure that I don't hate you first. This is such a common thing with guys who've gotten laid like a decent amount where because at the start you have this idea of like i will just sleep with literally anyone that will sleep with me and if they sleep mm -hmm. with me on the first day oh my god i'm a superhero like i'm a player i'm the coolest guy ever i'm a stud muffin i'm just a legend right if they will fuck me immediately the quicker they fuck me the cooler i am that's kind of your mm -hmm. thinking you do that a few times and like you meet some bipolar disorder chicks you you meet some girls that are just like horrible human beings and you're like why did i stick my dick in you like i don't even like you and then I find every single person does this. You slow it down and you go, th like, this is where I've been at for a while now. You go, I don't think I want to have sex on the first date anymore. Well, there has to be some, like, God-tier chemistry or something for that to happen. I actually like going on a date and just getting to know you and making sure I like you as a human being. If you're going to be in my bed after we've had sex and you're going to be lying there trying to cuddle me, it's like, I want to make sure, I, as you said, so graciously, I want to make sure I don't hate you. <laughs> So when, when did that slow down for you? Like, um, was there a moment in time? Was there a particular person? For me, there was, there was a couple of girls that I was like, I can't do this again. I have to slow it down. It, it's it been a ongoing process over the past couple months for me of like mm -hmm. making sure that I enjoy the person before I invite them back. But yeah, I would not say that I'm going as slow as you are, because if I like you, then we're coming back to my place. But sure. But there's it's still definitely... some intent to, to get to know them first, to make sure. Oh, like, absolutely. You can't just be a random hookup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I've never been a huge fan of random hookups because it's, I remember probably the fourth or fifth person I was with, uh, we had a conversation about sex is only good after the third or fourth time. And yes. it's not that sex is bad before then, but you have those two or or three warm-up sessions to learn mm -hmm. each other, to know what yes. really drives each other wild, to just mm -hmm. play with each other and experiment and explore and see where it goes. Yeah, there's this idea that people, it's usually people who aren't super experienced where they think like a one night stand or the first time you have sex is gonna be like some Hollywood, you know, perfect movie sex. And it's like, no, it's usually a little awkward and like, like you're clumsy and like mm -hmm. you'll try and make her orgasm, but like she's too, she doesn't know you well enough to say this isn't working. So you're just awkwardly doing something for like 20 minutes. And then you go, is this feeling good? And she's like, um, maybe it's kind of hurting a little bit. And you're like, oh shit. Okay. Like, should we try this other toy? And she's like, okay. And you try that and that doesn't work. And then you try a different toy. Like it, it's, it's awkward by default. It doesn't have to be super awkward, mm -hmm. but you're not as like, you're not in that flow state in that smooth, you know, I know what turns you on. I know what drives you crazy. You know how to turn me on. You know what to call me. I know what to call you. We've tried different toys, especially when you're doing like BDSM. I'm sure you will mm -hmm. attest like most chicks are especially girls who haven't done this very much are very 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 scared when you first say like i'm gonna spank you i'm gonna do this you have to hold back a lot you have to be really gentle and go slow and say how does that feel do you want me to spank you harder after the third or fourth time you can just kind of go crazy you can let loose mm -hmm. you know you know what her boundaries are she trusts you enough you trust her and you know what part of it is trust. yeah 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 and even for not bdsm even for just like normal maybe kinky or rough sex you know the first time you sleep with someone, unless you're really feeling the vibes, you're probably not going to be fully all the way in. You're probably not going to be pulling her fucking hair and saying, you dirty fucking whore. Like sometimes you say that the first time and she's like, why are you calling me that? And you're like, oh, okay. So it's just like, especially with really inexperienced girls, like virgins and, and stuff like that. Yeah. It's like you're, 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 you got to work up to that stuff. So mm -hmm. I fully agree with you. The first time it's fun. It's novel. It's new. I agree. It's most of the time, not the best sex that you will have. That's usually like the third or fourth time. Mm -hmm. And when you're having well, a one night stand, it's like, you're missing out on that. Plus, I like the people I like because I like them. Like, yeah, there's, there's a reason why we make friends. And there's a reason why I keep girls around because yeah, they're fun to be around. Yes, the sex is good. But it's one of those things of just like, okay, I could meet someone new tonight. I could mm -hmm. go out to a bar and start approaching people, which I do not have nearly enough experience with, but that's neither here nor there right now. Like, or I could hang out with one of my buddies mm -hmm. and we could get down later. Yeah. And there is something absolutely nice about like, I'm gonna fucking call up so-and-so and we're gonna watch some anime and then fuck each other's brains out. Yeah, yeah. Or I know that I like this person well enough that after sex, we can just lay there for an hour and a half and talk about shit. Like, how's your life going? What are you up to? How's that business that you were trying to start? You know, how's this? How's that? That's like all that. Yeah. Yeah. 
That and that's almost. <clears throat> I almost like that stuff equally, if not more, than the sex. And there are times, right? Especially if you really like someone, where the you're sex almost feels like the excuse. Man. I know, right? I know. <laughs> where it's like the excuse you're having sex as an excuse, so that you can cuddle and hang out afterwards, or so mm-hmm. that you can like do something afterwards. Yeah, there are times where it feels like that. It's almost like a catch up session, and the sex is the pretense for you to catch up. Mm-hmm. Just like you, you meet your buddies. You don't give a fuck about fishing, but you meet yeah. to f- you, you go fishing so that you can just fucking talk about shit. You don't exactly. really like that bar that you guys hang out and you have to, you're just meeting to fucking talk to each other. And this it's is a fucking pretest. dive. It's a fucking yeah. dive. But... Exactly. It's a shithole. Dive, by the way, is not a term that we use here. It's like a strictly okay. very American term. I know exactly what it means, but here we would just say like shithole bar, <laughs> like, like trashy dog, God awful bar. It's a fucking dive. Yeah. So I guess what's your, if someone is sitting there, let's, let's bring it back to what we talked about at the start, conservatism, okay. religion, and all that. Someone feels like they're shackled, you know, by conservative values or by religion or by Jesus's like fucking always watching eye. What would you, like, they want to shake free of it. What advice would you give them? They want to be uh, you now. They want BDSM. They want a bit of sex. They want to be at the point you're at. What would you say? Uh, you go meet Jesus. Okay. Not, not, not who the church told you who he he was but who he actually is go As in talk the to him loving accepting it, version the, the i'm talking about the jesus who spent all of his time hanging out with prostitutes and tax collectors i'm talking about the guy who yeah. decided you know what this right here is not the way that things should be there should not be a whole bunch of people like doing taxes and stuff in here i'm gonna sit in the corner and make a whip and throw a whole bunch of people out of the, the fucking temple because this is my daddy's house like Mm-hmm. i'm talking about the one who absolutely loved people and yeah. showed it in some absolutely strange ways like every conversation i've ever had with jesus has made me a more whole a more human mm-hmm. a more uh loving human being and it's been interesting being on this side of the coin where I definitely identify as Christian, but at the same time, I don't act very Christian right now. And people, my parents always are asking me, how are you and Jesus doing? You going to church yet? What's, what's, what's mm-hmm, going now? Mm-hmm. I'm like, don't worry. We'll get there when we get there. But when I started talking with Jesus again, when I was still sleeping with people, he never talked to me about how I was sleeping with people. He talked to me about the people I was sleeping with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He talked it's with like, me. It's like the being instead of the doing. It's like the doing doesn't exactly. really matter. It's, it's who are you as a person and who are they as people. It, and he talked to me about like, hey, you, you, you kind of were a little bit wishy-washy with that person because you were afraid of being honest there. Yes. Yes. Why, 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 why are you not showing up in that relationship? Yeah. Hey, you, you, you're, you're kind of avoiding this person. You should just tell her, Hey, yes. actually, I'm not really feeling it anymore mm-hmm. and cut things off. And so it's been an, an interesting thing of, yes, he still confronts me. Yes. He still shows me things that can be doing better, but at the same time, he's talking to me more about who I am than what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And we have the saying in Christianity that Jesus doesn't give a second chance. He gives another chance. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you fucked up. Congratulations. You're human. Yeah. So Jesus accounted for all of that before he died. Yeah. So yeah. what would my advice be to Jeremy from three years ago? Just go spend some more time with Jesus. It'll be fine. I like that. And it's almost like everything you're talking about here, you know, the other people, like your family and stuff who say like, are you going to church? Are you reading the Bible? All of that. They're looking at the surface level stuff and saying, okay, these are the things. If we just do these actions, we're a good Christian. It's almost like a checklist. If I tick all these boxes, I'm magically a good person. And it's like, hang on, you're missing like the actual important stuff, which is like, who are you as a person? What is your relation to a higher power or you know, if you're not religious, find the universe, or if you don't even want mm-hmm. to think like that, other people, you know, what is your 
day to day, like, how are you with other people? Are you, here's a better way of phrasing that. Are you emanating love or are you coming from a place of fear? And I see this a lot with religious people when they try and uh, tick off those check boxes. That's coming from a place of fear. They're, they're fearful of God's wrath. They're fearful of being a bad Christian. They're fearful of judgment from other Christians. They're fearful of not being a good person. That's not love. That's fear. That's being scared. That's not courage. Whereas if you have the courage to say, like, okay, can I just be a good person and almost trust that, you know, my higher power or Jesus or God or the universe will look after me as long as I'm a good person. If I haven't ticked off all these little boxes that probably don't really mean anything, they're just kind of almost like a comfort blanket. Like, can I just be a good person? Can I emanate love? Can I make the world better? Can I be nicer to other human beings? Can I seek out truth and honesty? Can I always come from or as best I can come from that place of honesty? Can I say the harsh truths if I know that it will ultimately lead to less suffering and more joy? These are the things that matter. These are the things that make you a good Christian. It's not, did I go to church and read the Bible? You can go to church and read the Bible and be a sanctimonious piece of shit who judges everybody else. And I even sound judgmental when I say that, but fuck it. And, you know, be you can be a terrible person and go to church and read the Bible. Or you can be the most loving human being of all time that... God or Jesus or any of that would say like, yeah, this person's getting into heaven. Fuck yeah. If there is a heaven, fuck yeah, this guy's getting in, even though he doesn't read the Bible and he doesn't go to church and he doesn't even know anything about Christianity, but he's in line with the values of, you know, kindness, love, honesty, and truth. Yeah. So really like I could sum up what you're saying, you know, the advice that you would give to your past self, which is really like, it's a form of, seek love seek truth something like that yeah like it's almost like like letting go of all the bullshit take away all the bullshit like just in do your, your case, best with today like, yeah yeah just do your and, best with today tomorrow will take care of itself and in your case it sounds like that manifests as like a direct connection to jesus like i'm gonna sit there and yeah. talk to this guy he's gonna talk back when I, because I'm not religious, but I know exactly what you're freaking talking about. I call that like the voice of the universe. It's like if you just mm -hmm. peel away all the bullshit, there is like a truth that's coming into your brain. Like we yeah. all we all can deceive ourselves, but it, you know that lying to your best friend doesn't make you happy and doesn't make him happy, and you don't want to do it. You know that if you just peel away all the bullshit, all the rationalizations, all the excuses, whether you want to call that God, Jesus, the universe, your own self, your own conscience, your own in a goodness, whatever you want to fucking call that. We know what's like good or what is healthy or happy or joyful or enlightened or any of these words. And you do have to kind of peel all the bullshit away. Like, mm -hmm. It's probably the biggest reason why, you know, half my articles, I say, be honest, be fucking, it's not just it. Partly it is because that helps with the retention, of course, but like you, no one has ever given me a compelling case for lying ever. And I have been given thousands of compelling cases for telling the truth and honesty. So I feel like that right there is at least a universal truth that we can agree on. No one's so ever given me a compelling case to be unkind. Exactly, exactly, exactly. No one's ever given me a compelling case to be hateful, to not be loving, to, to make the world worse. No one has ever given me a compelling reason to leave the world worse than you found it. Mm -hmm. you, you guys are welcome to try it. Write something in the comments. It will be something based on fear. You will say something like, but if I, you will say something like this, if I try and seek truth, I might get hurt. That's based on fear. That's, that's, and also sure, like you might get hurt if you seek out and lies as well. Like that's very short sighted a, because you're going to end up hurt either way. It's congratulations. You're living life. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There is this, uh, I think we are very driven by fears. Like I am too, a lot of the time. It, it, it's a process of like learning to let that go. <laughs> Bringing it back to sex. I see a lot of guys who... I was exactly the same who get into, you know, getting laid, the red pill, which is how you found all this stuff, any of that kind of stuff based on like a fear of being alone, a fear of being a loser, insecurities, which is why I started. At what point for you, was it just through the like discovery with Jesus? Was that the point where it switched to, okay, this isn't fear anymore. I actually like sex. Like, what was that moment in time? You touched on it at the start of this podcast, but that moment where you're like, okay, I'm not just doing this for insecurity now. I think I actually like sex. I think it's um, fun. That would be shortly after I broke up with my ex from the first half of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, so we started dating in January. 
that sounds about right. So we're going to go with that. Mm -hmm. um, and we were together for five months. Then I broke up with her. And the entire time, I didn't necessarily feel bad about it, but I didn't feel good about it. It was one of those things of like, we're shoving the feelings off to the side and we're not going to deal yeah. with them now. Yeah. yeah, I will deal with them at a later point, but that is not some, I'm, that is something I'm intentionally not dealing with right now. Like, mm -hmm. I, I want to be very specific that I was not uh, necessarily neglecting those feelings. I was aware mm -hmm. of them, but it was one of those things of, I'm going to figure this out at a later point, not today yep. sort of thing. Yep, yep. Um, and so we were together for two months and I was like, mm, I don't think I want to be in this relationship anymore. And then I thought, am I afraid of being in a relationship? Cause I just had mm. three friends with benefits and then I cut them off to be in a relationship. Like, is that what's going on? And so I stuck in the relationship and then I ended up cheating on her because I did not want to be in the relationship and was miserable in the relationship, which was still a poor choice. I should have broken up with her and then slept yep. with the person neither here nor there right now and then when i did finally break up with her uh she was none the wiser of my infidelity and then two weeks later i get a message from her saying hey can we talk and my response is well you've told me a lot of lies and slander since you last uh saw me so if you're going to apologize yes otherwise no you've got to apologize before you can get back into my life and so she apologized for the mean things she had said and said okay so i am pregnant with your child i said happy mother's day um and she took a pregnancy test for me and i'm like all righty then here we are hmm. and as i'm sure you're aware if you've already been sleeping with someone and you stop it's easy to sleep with that person again mm -hmm. so we started hanging out we started sleeping together again and then the miscarriage happened and that unleashed she was not in the best mental health to begin with mm -hmm. and was not accustomed to dealing with healthy people mm -hmm. so uh whenever she would have a dispute with me me saying i don't feel comfortable right now because you have said mean things about me and I do not want to take your actions for face value. However, yep, yep, your yep. behavior is hurtful. Yep, yep. Was not a conflict resolution style that she was okay with. She preferred yep. I was yelling at her. Yeah. She's not almost not used to like calm boundaries. Uh, she could not handle calm down confrontation. Hmm. So That was one half of it. The other half of it was I rose to meet her communication style instead of bringing her to mine. Mm -hmm. So whoopsie daisy. Uh, but then the miscarriage happened and I told her about the infidelity because she was pregnant and I'm jumping around. And I thought, okay, well, if we're going to be doing this for the next 18 years, at least, then I'm not going to build this on a ground of lies. Like, yep, yep, yep. Like, if we're going to do this, then let's fucking do this. And uh, so she was wishy-washy back and forth the entire time of like, I don't know if I want to be in a relationship with you. I don't know if I want to be here. Uh, please don't leave me. I don't know if we can do this. Uh, don't go. I don't want to be alone. And so after her threatening to put us on a break for about a month, I finally said, okay, we're taking a break. Mm -hmm. And you need to figure out if you want me to be here or not. Because if, if you think that I'm a bad person, then you shouldn't be around me because I'm not a bad person. I made a bad choice, but I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and I will acknowledge that a distinction there that people miss. And I will acknowledge that I made poor life choices faster than anyone else. Like I am the king of making bad choices. I will make more bad life choices in my lifetime. I guarantee that being said, I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm. And I defy you to tell me otherwise. And that's how that conversation went. And then over the week that we were taking time to figure out if we wanted to be in the relationship, I said, actually, I really don't. So skipping the drama drama, we broke up. And as I was driving away from her place, I felt a feeling that I assume, but I've never tried, but I assume is like cocaine. Like I had so much energy and like an appetite and I want like, I want to go fucking like 
have an orgy or punch a line in the dick or climb a mountain or start a business or something like let's fucking go bro almost like a feeling of freedom like freedom but like life like zeal like okay 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 like freedom is not a strong enough feeling or word for it because it was this sensation of not only do i have my freedom but i have the power to do something with it i can go do literally whatever i want this is exactly how i felt when i left my toxic relationship yeah and that was how afterwards it was like okay i am free i'm good to go let's see if any of my old friends with benefits are still interested. So one of them still was, and we hooked up that weekend and it was phenomenal. And there wasn't the shame or the guilt of it anymore. And I think it was partly the trauma of what I had just gone through, Mm -hmm. but there was also a sense of like, I'm owning it. This is my decision. Rather than being driven by like insecurity or almost running away from like a rebellion. It sounds like when you first started sex, it was almost like a weird, like bouncing back, like a rebellion from the, the religion it was the fulfillment of a long time desire for certain yeah. but at the same time it was something that i wanted but i wasn't allowed to want it was something that i craved but i wasn't allowed to need mm-hmm. and at the same time congratulations biology speaking you have a penis you're going to be horny sometimes yes <laughs> it sounds like you're in a much better place with with uh, sex in general like your your relationship to sex your relationship to your masculinity even we could call it that your relationship Absolutely. to other people do you still have any guilt around sex or is there a feeling of like afterwards of like oh you, you know what i mean by guilt i put too much i i glamorize that too much i expected too much out of that it's just sex no nah. that? yeah nah. that's gone for me too and that took a, a while for me that's only gone in the last like maybe two years maybe a year and a half where after sex, I can just accept it for what it is rather than expecting, because I used to self-medicate with sex. Like even, even a year and a half ago, I would have se- I would like be having a bad week and I'd be like, yeah, but I'm going to get late on Friday. You get late on Friday and then you're like, oh fuck, is that it? Like I, I thought that this was going to fix the week and it's like, no, you didn't fix the week because you've been depressed or you haven't hung out with your friends or you had a to-do list that you haven't finished or your apartment is messy. You need to fix that and then enjoy the sex. I definitely have uh, used sex self-medication in the past year or two, but for the most part, I would say that I am definitely more towards that place of like, no, fuck yeah, that was good sex. High five afterwards. Like, yeah, yeah. I don't remember if I read that on a red pill article or something like that, but well, high five it was one of those things of like, sex. high five your girl after sex, man. It keeps like things that. casual and fun. I, okay, so my, I, I've never high fived after sex, but like the this girl that we're seeing now, when we, um, after like when we first had sex, when she first had sex because she was a virgin. Afterwards, I was like, "Put your hands up, who's a virgin?" And it's like, we don't put our hands <laughs> up. <laughs> so like similar to that shit, yeah, yeah. Fist bump after sex, fucking lock arms and just yeah. We've got it, boys. that supposed to be some asmr yeah fuck yeah i hate asmr it tri- it's so fucking creepy it's like the creepiest thing ever it's the sounds you hear right before you're you're like raped or something you're like hey there how's it going and it's like oh my god i'm gonna get raped like literally I'm that's gonna be a hard raped. pass for me i don't like getting raped thank you yeah uh yeah i'd say probably that's yeah that's on my like no thank you list as well now that i think about it but yeah